Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're so happy to have you joining us in today's event, Border Health, Evidence and Policy Issues. Our event flows from our July 2021 thematic issue on border health and immigrant health, the first time we've ever done an issue on these topics. The issue is so filled with content that we've broken our briefings on the issue in half. Today's event will focus on health at the border, both sides of the US and Mexican border. Subsequent event in just a week and a half, we'll look at the health of immigrants, how they're receiving care, how they're faring and the like. The topics we're going to be discussing today are critical for Americans, whether they're on the United States side or the Mexican side of the border or anywhere in the Northern, Central, Latin or South America. Issues of immigration, issues of border health are critical in the entire region. And so often these issues are spoken of as policy matters, not as human humanitarian matters. And the humanitarian approach, I think, will be part of what you hear about today. We're talking about people facing often very complex, very difficult circumstances, seeking a better life for themselves and their families, and running into barriers created by policies or barriers that could have been lifted that weren't lifted by policies adopted by countries in the region. The way our briefings work now that we're in this virtual space is that we'll have an opportunity to hear from authors of some of the papers in the issue. There will be a little bit of time for question and answer after the author presentations. We'll then move to a policy discussion about the future of health policy at the border. Throughout the event, you have the opportunity to submit questions just below the screen where you're watching. Uh, I'll do my best to fold those questions into the conversation, but I will tell you that the earlier you get them in, the easier it is for me to read them. So if you've already thought of some questions, now wouldn't be a bad time to go ahead and type them in, but feel free to do so throughout the event. And we're always asked if these events are recorded and this one, like all others will be, and it will be available on our website just uh, within a couple of days after we can load up uh, the video and the audio. The entire issue that we prepared was a team event. I want to acknowledge the financial support of the California Healthcare Foundation, the California Endowment, and the Conalma Health Foundation. And you'll be hearing later from our ABLE theme advisor, Arturo Bustamante, who really ushered this entire issue through from beginning to end, and we're very grateful for his uh, participation and support in our work. It's now my great honor to be able to introduce the president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation. It was their thinking that led to the early conversations around this issue and ultimately uh, the theme issue and this event as well. And we're very proud of our ability to advance the scholarship in this area uh, in a policy relevant way. Uh, I've known and worked with Sandra Hernandez for many years. She's president and CEO of the California Healthcare Foundation, was the CEO of the San Francisco Foundation for 16 years, has been the director of public health for the city and county of San Francisco. Um, for a few opening remarks, Sandra, I turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Alan, appreciate that. And welcome everybody. Good morning, those of you on the West Coast and good afternoon to those of you that are on the East Coast. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction, Alan. Um, one of the things you don't get in resumes is where people grew up. And I grew up 45 miles from the US-Mexican border in Southern Arizona. And uh, really, as a, as a young person, have seen and watched over the years sort of the economic and cultural uh, porousness of our borders and really how uh, both sides uh, of the border really uh, do influence one another. Um, Pre-pandemic, I had the opportunity uh, to 
uh, visit uh, Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, uh, and really saw this extraordinary relationship across the border uh, with not-for-profits and philanthropic entities and business leaders, uh, really working to support um, much of what was going on in supporting migrants who were in the border uh, in Nogales, uh, and doing so in an incredibly collaborative way. Uh, and it uh, sparked for me, of course, this notion that notwithstanding the policies that Alan's referencing, the people on these borders really uh, are families. They're family members that live in, in one side or the other. Uh, and as a California Healthcare Foundation really had the opportunity pre-pandemic to really look at the humanitarian issues that Alan referenced as a result of many years of policies really on both sides of the border. And as Alan said, very much now, as you think about the pandemic, uh, it makes us all the more aware uh, that uh, th there is no border when it comes to health, mental health, viruses, or the like. And so the California Healthcare Foundation was really uh, honored to be able to uh, add to the evidence and to the research from researchers on both sides of the border uh, with a coalition that we put together to look at these issues before the pandemic. And uh, coming uh, on the heels of the pandemic, we thought uh, it was time to really add to that research and evidence. And so we were uh, very pleased to be able to sponsor this and to work closely with Alan and his team. Um, I want to appreciate um, uh, Professor uh, Bustamante for his amazing work on the issue. I want to thank our, our colleagues at the California Endowment. I look forward to meeting our folks at Guanalma Health Foundation in New Mexico, where my family is also from. And uh, I think uh, the uh, issue is compelling and incredibly timely. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, I think uh, uh, you're, you're in for uh, an amazing presentation today, and I look forward to seeing you again when we take the second part up uh, on the immigrant health. So thank you, Alan, very much. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so when we have a thematic issue, we have uh, 15 or so empirical papers that provide new information to people in the field. And the first half of our event today will be a presentation of five of those papers. And then because our scholarship is always oriented to policy, we'll invite a few additional folks in after for a conversation that's more focused directly on policy. I'm going to introduce all five of our author presenters at the outset and they'll go in order and uh, we've asked them to be uh, concise in their presentation. We'll have, as I mentioned, a little bit of time for some questions when they're done. You'll hear first from Elizabeth Pollack, a research and analytics scientist at the University of Wisconsin's Population Health Institute at Madison. You'll then hear from Rodrigo Dominguez Villegas, director of research at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Uh, Sharon Borja will come next, assistant professor in the Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Houston. C. Nicholas uh, Cuneo, assistant professor and hospitalist at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine with a joint appointment at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Center for Public Health and Human Rights. And uh, Yetza Bajorquez, a general practitioner and professor researcher at El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, an institution uh, whose objective is to generate scientific knowledge about the regional phenomena at the US-Mexico border. And between 2007 and 2010, uh, Dr. Bajorquez was director of the area for operations research at the Department of Epidemiology for the Health Ministry of Mexico. Uh, I'll turn over first uh, to Elizabeth Pollack to kick us off. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, like Alan said, my name is Elizabeth Pollack and I'm a research and analytics scientist with the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. 
I'm honored to be a part of this briefing presentation and to talk to you today about some of our findings from our publication on life expectancy at the US-Mexico border, evidence of disparities by place, race, and ethnicity. Next slide, please. So the US-Mexico border region of the United States spans more than 2,000 miles across four states and the constant flow of people, services, and goods across the border contributes to a complex and dynamic socioeconomic, cultural, and demographic ecosystem, as well as to a unique set of population health opportunities and challenges. Some barriers to good health, such as high poverty rates, limited access to health care, and discriminatory policies and practices are related to the region's poor performance on several health indicators and to health disparities in its population. However, what has not been readily available in the literature has been an overall description of the mortality experience of the region. Life expectancy, or the average number of years that a person can expect to live, can be a powerful catalyst to improve the health of communities. Therefore, the primary objective of our study was to calculate life expectancy for the cluster of counties on the US side of the border region by sex, race, ethnicity, and urbanization. Then to improve understanding of the disparities specific to this area, key comparisons were made between the border region, the cluster of remaining counties in the four border states, and the US as a whole. So to define the border region, we adopted the definition established by the US-Mexico Border Health Commission under the La Paz Agreement, which defines the area as the aggregate of 44 counties within 100 kilometers or about 62 miles of the border. Non-border counties of the border states represented an aggregate of the remaining 316 counties in Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. Data on mortality were obtained from the National Center for Health Statistics and included age group specific deaths and population during the years 2016 to 2018. Life expectancy from birth was calculated using Cheng's methodology of abridged life tables using five-year age intervals. And life expectancy was also calculated for subgroups based on sex, race, ethnicity, and county-based level of urbanization for the border region, the non-border counties of the border states, and the US as a whole. Next slide, please. So we found that on average, life expectancy at birth for residents in the border region was 81.1 years, which was slightly higher than that of residents living in non-border counties with 80.3, and the country as a whole was 79.1. However, the disparity in life expectancy between racial ethnic subgroups in the region was also greater, with a range of more than 13 years. Within the border region, American Indian Alaska Native residents had the shortest life expectancy at 75 years, compared with 78.4 years for Black residents, 80.6 for white residents, 81.6 for Hispanic residents, and 88.1 years for Asian residents. Although white, black, and Asian residents of the border region could expect to live longer than residents of the US in the non-border region, Hispanic and American Indian residents could not. American Indian and Hispanic residents lived on average almost two years less than those populations nationwide. There were also geographic differences with residents living in border, the border region's urban counties being expected to live almost three years longer than those living in the region's rural counties. However, with over 90% of the border region's population living in urban areas, the overall estimates for the area are dominated by large population centers, such as San Diego, California, and Tucson, Arizona. It is important to note some limitations of these estimates. Incomplete death certificates and misclassification of age or race ethnicity, particularly for the American Indian population, is well documented. Also, race ethnicity was categorized into five mutually exclusive subgroups, which might mask important differences that exist for subgroups with multiple ancestries or ethnic origins and individuals who may classify as multiple races. Finally, the data don't include deaths from COVID-19, so we have yet to see the impact of the pandemic on life expectancy in this region, but early evidence would suggest that due to the pandemic, these disparities will have only worsened. Next slide, please. So all that being said, understanding life expectancy disparities in the border region will be critical for establishing a baseline for health improvement. Data and its disaggregation are essential to support efforts to ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to live a long and healthy life. But by providing averages across racial and ethnic groups, sex, or urbanization, we often miss stark differences in how well and how long different groups are living. Differences that can lead to more targeted resources for those who need it most. 
So this study provides context and a point of comparison on life expectancy in the region that can hopefully serve as a first step in helping to understand these gaps. We do encourage further disaggregation within the data to account for other factors that might have an impact, such as country of origin, immigration status, immigration generation, or tribal membership. But working with all groups in the area to participate in data collection, dissemination, and in identifying and implementing solutions will be critical to improving health outcomes in the border region for all of its residents. Uh, so thank you so much, and I encourage you to check out our full publication for more detailed information. Thank you so much. We'll turn now to Rodrigo Dominguez Villegas. Great. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Dominguez Villegas, and I'm the director of research at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Uh, thank you so much for having me here to present the findings of a paper that I co authored with Arturo Vargas Bustamante. Uh, next slide, please. So we are experiencing a unique moment in the history of migration between Mexico and the United States. While the number of Mexicans in the US grew uh, since the 1940s, uh, ever since 2008, more people have returned to Mexico than have arrived to the US. Millions have returned to Mexico since that year. This flow of return migration is comprised of two groups, people deported by the US government and people who return by themselves or vol voluntary returning. As migrants navigate their return, access to healthcare becomes one of their most pressing needs, particularly for migrants with chronic and mental conditions. Research investigating barriers, uh, to, barriers to access to healthcare faced by repatriated Mexican migrants is scarce though. To give you a little bit of context, the Mexican health system is highly fragmented and poorly funded. The Mexican public health system comprises two different types of public agencies. One type, the Social Security Institute, provides healthcare coverage to formal, to formal and salaried employees and their families using a health code per uh, delivery model similar to that in the Veterans um, Health Administration in the US. Um, for the population excluded from formal employment, a safety net provider jointly administered by the federal government and the 32 state governments, which was previously known as Seguro Popular and now was renamed as the Instituto de Salud para el Bienestar in 2020, um, is responsible for offering, offering healthcare to those that are not covered by social security. Return migrants, many of which have spent a significant amount of time in the US, have to learn how to navigate a complex system in which healthcare from public insurance plans is unreliable and patients have to supplement with private sector coverage. But given the, sudden, the, the suddenness of deportation, you know, it's likely that deportees have a more difficult time accessing the services that they need upon return. So our study examines, the, examines differences in healthcare insurance coverage between Mexican born deportees and returnees during a five year period compared to those of not migrants and returnees who had been in Mexico for five years or more. Uh, next slide, please. We use data from the 2014 and 2018 waves of the Encuesta Nacional de la Dinámica Demográfica, which is a national survey of demographic, Institute, uh, demographic dynamics or NADIV. And we use nested regression models to control, uh, controlling for demographic, socioeconomic, employment, and migration characteristics of the people in the sample. We then use these regression models to estimate the predicted probability of being covered by health insurance. So the figure you see right now in the slide show shows the predicted probability of changes in health insurance coverage among deportees in their first five years after return. Uh, it illustrates how health insurance coverage changed from, from years one to five after migrants returned to Mexico. The reference population had the highest uh, predicted probability of having health insurance around 88.4% for all five years. Deportees had the lowest access to health insurance coverage immediately after return with an average of 67.5% predicted probability. And the voluntary returnees fell in between the two populations with a pr uh, predicted probability of 73.9% immediately after returning. As you can see in the graph with the confidence intervals bands, uh, differences between voluntary returnees and deportees were not statistically significant. But during the first two years after their return, both groups of return migrants, which are the green band and the blue band, uh, I mean the blue band and the red band, um, have lower health insurance uh, coverage rates than Mexican born residents who never left 
with V4T is faring worse than other returnees. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, my research and other research on the field shows three main structural barriers that both groups of return migrants face. Uh, the first one is burdensome uh, bureaucratic reg uh, regulations where return migrants are asked to present a myriad of documents that many do not even know about, uh, which include proof of residence in Mexico, which if you have just arrived, it's really hard to get. The second is a, a social stigma and discrimination as both groups of return migrants are frequently labeled as criminals, regardless of how they return to Mexico, even by government officials. And the third is the lack of reintegration programs that would provide long-term assistance so return migrants can access the health services they need. While many deportees are greeted by Mexican authorities through a reception program after deportation, this does not reach voluntary returnees and it does not provide longer-term assistance. Next slide, please. And so to end in our research, we suggest three important and actionable policy changes. First one is to accept more forms of identification in Mexico, including consular IDs or matricula consulares that are an official document issued by Mexican consulates in the US. Ironically, this form of identification is um, accepted by several states in the US, 33 states in the US as official um, document, as an official document, but it is not accepted back in Mexico. So accepting that document will be important and important way for getting to people getting people to enroll into services faster. Second is to provide better services in the US to prepare migrants for their return to Mexico, including issuing the identification documents people will need after returning and enrolling people in all the programs that they might be eligible for before their return. And third, to raise awareness about return migrants and their contributions to Mexico. Having large anti-discrimination campaigns is especially important for government employees and for the bureaucrats whose job is to serve people and to help them enroll in health services. Next slide, please. So this is a quick overview of our study. I encourage all of you uh, to read it in the, in the issue and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn now to Sharon Borja. Thank you, Alan. On behalf of my co-authors, I would like to thank Health Affairs for the opportunity to present our research regarding US, migrant, um, US citizen migrant children at today's event. Historically, the arrival of thousands of children at the US border has gotten significant attention. On the other hand, US citizen children migrating from the United States to Mexico have largely remained in the shadows and they're receiving less consideration from the media or even from us academic researchers. I myself was not aware of the subpopulation of migrant children until I attended a Congress at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México not too long ago. I did not know then that there were already more than half a million US citizen migrant children that have already been living in Mexico in 2015. That is about the, um, next slide please. That is about the population of the whole state of Wyoming or the whole city of Atlanta, give or take a few thousands. More than 45% of the half a million children lived in states near the US border. After looking into the literature, we discovered that there's very little empirical information available on US citizen migrant children in Mexico especially regarding their health status and access to health insurance coverage. So we sought to expand our knowledge regarding this largely ignored population of migrants through the following objectives. Next slide, please. First, we explored the distribution of US citizen migrant children in Mexico. <clears throat> we wanted to know where these children are located, which state has the most children, and what percentage were residing near the US border. Then we examined geographic differences in access to health insurance, particularly between those residing in Mexican states near the US border versus those in other states. Finally, we tested whether individual or household characteristics such as having an employed parent, whether the household was receiving remittances and state level factors such as density of professionals, um, levels of violence were associated 
with the probability of US citizen migrant children having employment-based insurance in Mexico. What we found was sobering. We found high rates of underinsurance or having mostly government-sponsored health insurance, which is limited coverage and protection that leaves children vulnerable to delayed care and catastrophic spending. More than 53% of that population were underinsured. That is like having more than half of the state of Wyoming not having access to good quality health insurance, or about half of the whole state of Atlanta being vulnerable to delayed care due to longer wait times. We also found place-based disparities in underinsurance rates. Rates in underinsurance in urban areas was much higher compared to rural areas where 80% of children were underinsured. 65% of those who lived in states near the US border did not have employment-based coverage and therefore were underinsured. Finally, we found that where a US citizen migrant child lived mattered for their having access to employment-based insurance. Living in an urban area decreases the probability of having employment-based coverage by 26%, while living in a state near the US border reduces that probability by 59%. In light of these findings, and on behalf of the thousand of US migrant children in Mexico that have remained in the shadows for a long time, we offer the following recommendations. Next slide, please. First, we need national policies that expedite the dual citizenship process in Mexico. This could help facilitate access to health insurance where access to government-sponsored health coverage depends on having proof of citizenship or legal residency in Mexico. Second, by national policies to recognize birth certificates from either Mexico or the US as a proof of dual citizenship could further streamline the process of qualifying for government-sponsored health insurance, particularly because the certificates already bear their parents' nationalities. Third, we believe that improving the economic and social reintegration policies for parents returning to Mexico from the U.S. could have significant impact on improving access of their U.S. citizen migrant children to employment-based insurance. Fourth, we recommend the continued Medicaid and CHIP coverage for U.S. citizen migrant children living in the 80 Mexican municipalities within 100 kilometers of the U.S. border. These children could benefit from removing the residency requirements of Medicaid, so they have the option to continue receiving from their U.S. Um, health providers in person or through telecare. And finally, we recommend the creation of a work group on U.S. citizen migrant children within the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission that could monitor the health status of this hardly recognized population of children and youth migrants. We believe that in the long term, investing in uh, U.S. citizen migrant children in Mexico has greater economic and societal returns than the cost of reducing gaps in healthcare access through their increased productivity and better health outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now hear from Nicholas uh, Cuneo. Nick? Hi, my name is Nick Cuneo and I'm an assistant professor and physician at Johns Hopkins. I'm very excited to be a part of this important discussion today and to share a brief overview of my team's paper entitled What Counts as Safe? Exposure to Trauma and Violence Among Asylum Seekers from the Northern Triangle. Next slide, please. Immigration uh, enforcement at the US-Mexico border over the four years of the last administration was subject to a dizzying number of changes. These policies were essentially designed to sequentially undermine the right to asylum in the United States, and they effectively abrogated our country's duty to provide humanitarian protection to those fleeing persecution to countries with far fewer resources and far greater levels of insecurity and violence. Starting with the advent of the migrant protection protocols in January 2019, this strategy culminated in the signing and preliminary implementation of the asylum cooperative agreements with El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, which collectively constitute the so-called Northern Triangle of Central America over the second half of 2019. Next slide, please. The asylum cooperative agreements, which allowed the U.S. to deport asylum seekers to Northern Triangle countries for 
asylum processing were built on the legal architecture of the existing Canada-US Safe Third Country Agreement, which had a basis in international law grounded in the expectation that both countries respect human rights and offer a high degree of protection to asylum seekers. However, a significant and growing percentage of US asylum seekers are from the Northern Triangle and seeking asylum currently due to perceived lack of safety or protection from harm in their countries of origin. And this casts doubt on the legal justification for these agreements. Next slide, please. To investigate this concerning contradiction and the recent human rights landscape in the Northern Triangle, we performed a document analysis of forensic medical legal affidavits from a sample of Northern Triangle asylum seekers presenting to an academic asylum clinic in Boston, Massachusetts from 2017 to 2020. The forensic affidavits are sworn statements from independently licensed clinicians, which serve as a form of expert testimony on the physical and psychological sequelae of past torture and trauma and can be used by immigration attorneys to corroborate their clients' narratives. We generated a codebook through an iterative process to be able to capture descriptive data from the affidavits on trauma and clinical characteristics, which we subsequently analyzed using Stata. Next slide, please. All of the asylum seekers in our sample had some uh, form of trauma exposure, and 91.2% reported repeated trauma. Forms of trauma most commonly included threats, sexual assault, and violence perpetrated against family or friends. 63.2% of asylum seekers reported trauma that occurred before the age of 18, despite 80.7% of our sample consisting of individuals aged 21 or older at the time of the interview. While women were more likely to report sexual assault and intimate partner violence, men were more likely to report peers as perpetrators. Notably, 14% of individuals identified state officials as perpetrators of violence, and 15.8% disclosed active denial of protection from the state when it was solicited. There was a significant burden of psychiatric diagnoses across our sample with 78.9% of individuals meeting criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder and 59.6% meeting criteria for major depressive disorder with 52.6% reporting a history of self-injurious or suicidal behavior and or ideation. Next slide, please. Our findings indicate that Northern Triangle asylum seekers presenting to a single asylum clinic report targeted and pervasive violence in their countries of origin, in some cases with ineffectual or even participating state actors. These suggest that asylum seekers would be subject to a dangerous environment on removal to any of the three Northern Triangle countries under full implementation of the asylum cooperative agreements. In response to these findings, we issued a number of policy recommendations, some of which have already been acted upon by the current administration. The transit ban, which categorically denied asylum to anyone at the southern border who had transited through El Salvador, Guatemala, or, Andor or Honduras en route to the United States, was already enjoined by a federal district court on uh, February 16th of this year and is currently under review by the Biden administration. In addition to advocating for it to be formally withdrawn by the administration, we recommend oversight hearings be held to understand and address the consequences of this ban while it was in place. Another major issue was the opacity of implementation of these policies under the previous administration, for which we have called for improved and durable tracking mechanisms to document credible fear interviews at the border, which is already underway in response to recommendations by the U.S. Government Accountability Office. While we are encouraged by the suspension of the asylum cooperative agreements by the Biden administration, which took place on February 6, 2021, it is important that they be full, fully terminated along with the five-year bar to the U.S. entry imposed on those who are subject to preliminary implementation. And investigations should be conducted to determine who was subjected to expedited removals under these agreements and provide an opportunity for redress. The Central American Miners Program, which was started by the Obama administration but discontinued early on in the Trump administration, offers a novel in-country refugee parole program for vulnerable miners. It's already been reopened by the Biden administration and is currently being expanded to increase eligibility, which we feel is important, particularly in light of the significant burden of trauma reported among participants in our study when they were minors. The matters of AB and LEA, which were put in place by AG Sessions in um, 2018 and seen by many to be targeted at eroding asylum eligibility for individuals from the Northern Triangle in particular, given the uniquely high burden of gang-related trauma and gender-based violence in this population, uh, were thankfully recently vacated by AG Garland on June 16th, uh, 2021. 
Finally, the Biden administration has disappointingly chosen to continue the CDC Title 42 ban, which exploits the pandemic to detain and expel people seeking asylum at the border while allowing many other travelers to enter. With no real public health basis in the setting of science-based measures now available to screen individuals seeking asylum, we call on the current administration to rescind this Trump era order, which is continuing to negatively impact Northern Triangle asylum seekers at the border. Next slide, please. Uh, so in, uh, in summary, thank you so much for your time and attention and many thanks to my co-authors along with the Massachusetts General Hospital Asylum Clinic and Center for Global Health for supporting this work. We further appreciate Health Affairs for providing a platform for this very important policy discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And our final paper presentation will be uh, Yetza Baharkis. Thank you. So I'm very happy to be here and I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Cesar Infante from National Institute of Public Health and Silvana Larrea and Isabel Vietes from the Population Council from Mexico. So the, the population I want to address in this, in this, uh, in this conversation is a, it's a mixed flow of population. And I think this is important because uh, while the, our paper is focused on the needs of people in transit, which is more or less the population that Nick was discussing in his, in his presentation, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, persons who are going through Mexico uh, aiming to, to enter the United States are a combination of economic migrants and uh, asylum seekers who are running or fleeing their countries of origin because of violence, because of climate change and, and natural disasters, etc. So even if they don't qualify, uh, if eventually they might not qualify for asylum, they still have very similar needs to all uh, to other refugees ar around the world. And so every country that, that has uh, some responsibility to, to care for these populations. So in the case of Mexico, what we are seeing is this uh, in transit flow, but it's not so much in transit as uh, especially the last year, People was being uh, stopped in their in their migration project. They had to wait in the Mexican side of the border because of the migration uh, migrant protection protocols that made them wait for their their asylum process to continue uh, while remaining in Mexico. So the needs of this population uh, had to be uh, seen through them uh, by the Mexican government. And that's why we decided to study the response of the Mexican government to the health needs of this population during the, during the pandemic. So please the next slide. Okay, so our main aim was to analyze the public health policies issued in Mexico in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we did was uh, just a policy document search. And this is important because we didn't analyze if the public health policy was actually being enacted. We just analyzed what it was in the paper or on paper. So we did a, a policy document search uh, of documents issued by the federal level of the, of the Mexican government, but also by the five states that are uh, closer to the border. There are six states in the Mexican side of the border, but five of them have uh, uh, important cities or, or population sites in the, close to the US border. And nine mun municipalities where uh, migrants in transit or asylum seekers concentrate uh, during, have been concentrating during this uh, pandemic. And we focus on those uh, public health policies that were issued in response to the pandemic. So what we wanted to see it was if these uh, policies were including the needs of this uh, migrant population. Next slide, Julie, please. Okay. So I'm going to stay in this slide for, for a while because these are our main results and at the same time, our main recommendations. So we identified six major gaps. The first one that was that migrants were mentioned only in a minority of documents, about 20% of the documents we, we found uh, even mentioned migrants, uh, either migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, et cetera. And some groups of migrants were, were invisible in this policy. So while the Mexican government in previous years tended to, to think of migration in terms of Mexican migration, Mexicans in the, in the US-Mexico migration circuit, in this period, what happened was that the, the, the focus turned like completely to these uh, groups of migrants in transit, especially from Central America. So the other groups became uh, invisible in a sense in, the, in this policy. 
But even for, for these migrants in transit, there were very few policies that addressed their special needs. The entitlements of these migrants to, to health care or health, health coverage were not made explicit, although implicitly they might have been considered because there were, there were references to the new uh, general health law that says that every person who is in Mexico and has a health care need is entitled to care by the, by the public health system. But those entitlements were not made explicit in the, in the policies. Another thing was that the diverse characteristics of migrants were not considered. Uh, we are seeing an inflow of migrants from many different regions. And uh, for example, people who speak languages other than English and Spanish. And those characteristic, characteristics were not considered in any of the policies we, we, we found. There were no provisions for obtaining data on migrant health other than COVID. Most policies were focused on the, on the epidemiologic, uh, epidemiological aspects of COVID, and there were no pro provisions for other data on migrant health. So there's no way to orient the, the public policy for migrants in, uh, in other areas on all, other aspects. And uh, the policies were, of course, focused on preventing transmission, but there are other health issues that are important during the pandemic and were not considered in the case of migrants, for example, uh, maternal health, child health, mental health, etc. And finally, and most importantly, there was no operationalization. There were no uh, like concrete provisions so that the policies could be enacted. There were no mentions to funding, where the funding was going to come from. Uh, there were very few specificities about who was responsible to provide this uh, health care, for example. It, there was mentions. There were mentions to jurisdictions, which are the local local level of the health system in Mexico, and also to civil society organizations as being responsible to provide care for migrants, but without any any provisions of how that care was going to be covered. So it was a matter of civil society organizations had to find their own their own means to take care of the migrants. So these six gaps are aspects that should be addressed by the by the policy in the Mexican side and from the Mexican government point of view in order to provide uh, migrants with care and uh, ensure their right to to health and this this type of, of uh, this situation is what has uh, made uh, analysis such as the mipex index analysis which is an analysis of how in included are migrants in the in the health policies of a country to call the Mexican policies uh, integration in paper. So while there is a degree of integration of, of migrants and, and, and uh, discourse of that migrants are, are going to be included in, in the health policies in Mexico, still there are many gaps that mean and, and re probably result in the lack of inclusion of, the, of these populations in, in health. So thank you very much. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I have a couple of sort of narrower questions that have come in and then I want to broaden out to one or two themes before we turn to our panel. Um, quickly, uh, Rodrigo, someone asked uh, that you compared deportees and voluntary returnees. Um, someone asked the share of each of those and I wondered if you could just clarify. Yeah, um, so there are many estimates. Um, the The best estimates we have is that around 14% of all returned migrants are deported migrants, um, and then the rest are people. And I wanna be a little bit clear in what we considered voluntary returnees. Basically, we put them, uh, these are people who were not forcibly returned by either ICE or CBP, or Customs and Border Protection, uh, back to Mexico. Yeah, so the term voluntary might be, you know, a little bit put in quotation. Some of them are family members of others who were de deported. Uh, some of them, you know, are somewhat, uh, they're not really voluntary returnees. Many of them are. Uh, but yeah, but around 14% of all the people who are returning um, were forcibly returned. Thank you. Uh, Nick, you mentioned the Central American Miners Program and you went by it fairly quickly, but called for an expansion. I wondered if you could just say a couple more sentences about what it is. Yeah, so I mean, it initially was more narrowly defined the population eligible for this sort of remote evaluation of, um, of credible fear and uh, this background uh, process that is sort of akin to our 
refugee resettlement process. Um, it was a unique program that allowed for uh, sort of parents of minors in Central America to sponsor their children um, to come to the United States uh, and not have to go, you know, by foot uh, and make the harrowing journey through Mexico, um, but could board a plane with an appropriate sort of humanitarian visa and um, go through a process uh, for for screening. Um, that you know was was terminated by uh, Trump early on in 2017. It left a lot of folks who had already been cleared in limbo. There was a lot of um, subsequent court action. Uh, it's already been reopened, but they are talking about expanding eligibility to other forms of caregivers to allow for um, a, a larger number of folks to you know, engage in this process, which I think is, um, uh, is definitely preferable to, to having people have to make the journey um, and, and go through the uh, southern border. So that's currently what is happening. They're basically just talking about expanding eligibility based on who the uh, sponsor is in the United States. Thank you. I wanna follow up on a comment that you made at the outset about sort of the, the boundary between a migrant and an asylee or asylum seeker. Uh, we are sort of obsessed with these different categories and putting people in the right category so they can get access to the right things. and that permeability seems to underline, uh, underlie so many of the uh, analyses that we publish this month. I'm also struck by the comment about the invisibility of the population. So I guess I, I want to ask a sort of a broader question that I'm sure we'll get into more in the second panel. And it has to do with the degree to which the governments in setting their policy view the people who are the subject of these various studies, and I realize they're different in each one, as sort of a temporary phenomenon. They're here, but they're going to leave, and we don't really need to worry very much about them. Uh, or a, a permanent part of their community, in which case you might imagine a greater degree of concern, uh, or part of a global uh, expectation that we take care of asylum seekers or an interloper, someone who's here, but we really kind of wish they weren't. And therefore, there's no reason we would have policies to support them. And I've just sort of put out a number of different ways of thinking about it. But it feels to me that in the popular press, we alternate in characterizing the populations we're describing in, in, in each of these different ways. And I just wonder for those of you who conducted some of these analyses, the degree to which as you look at the data and as you look at the policies, you feel like certain uh, ways of characterizing the population uh, along the lines I described or a different way uh, are the reason for some of the policies that you've observed or some of the outcomes that you've observed. It's a very broad question. So I'm happy to have anyone take a start at it. Yeah, so go ahead, please kick us off. Yeah, I think this is a very important issue because uh, we have all suffered, I think, with writing papers and being asked to define the exact population we're talking about. And it's really difficult because sometimes it seems like we're leaving aside that part of the population because of, for administrative reasons, you need to classify these populations, but still they are, there are very, very uh, mixed or, or inter, intersections between this, this, these groups. And in a previous paper I published, uh, we, were, we were comparing between Mexican policies and Colombian policies towards migrants. And it was very interesting to see how Mexico at the time, that was 2018, uh, Mexico was focused on the Mexican migration. So they really, they used the word migrant to refer to this Mexican migration. Was in Colombia, migrant meant Venezuelan migrants who were entering Colombia. And Colombia was uh, issuing a series of policies for integration and inclusion because they were thinking in terms of a population that was coming to stay. And Mexico was thinking in terms of a population that was migrant just for a little time. And even when they return, and that's interesting with what, what Rodrigo was saying, uh, when they return, they are going to be migrants just for a little while. And then they are going to be Mexicans and everything will be okay, no? So that, that sort of vision, I think has to do with the migrant experience or the experience with migration of each country and it reflects in the public health policy. So my invitation will be for, for policymakers to take into account all these different populations that might not be so visible at the time, but are still there in big numbers. So that's important to think about. 
Thank you. Other thoughts on this topic? I was sure I would get more takers on this. Okay, what? Oh, Rodrigo, you're, no? Yes. Oh, you said it exactly the way that I was thinking about it. Um, it's, it's, categorization is so, sometimes dictates policies and it's so important to be super careful about it. So I uh, agree with what you said. Um, said. And Sharon, you mentioned uh, at the outset of your comments, this notion that you sort of weren't even aware of this population until you attended a discussion. So I'm just curious, uh, do you see evidence that uh, the US government is focused on this group because these are US citizens? Do you see evidence that the Mexican government is focused on this population because they're in their country and presumably uh, as children, they're likely to stay or is it really a, a hidden group? Yeah, unfortunately, we do not see evidence of interest on this um, children. Um, that much. They are really forgotten. They are in the shadows. And um, there is some attention from uh, some researchers, some of the people that we've partnered in Mexico. Um, I've attended a few conferences in Mexico where I've met fellow researchers from Jalisco, for example, because they have the highest number of, um, of an unweighted number of U.S. citizen migrant children in Mexico, and there is some interest at the at, within academic researchers, but not much in the media. So they're pretty much in the shadows, and and we're hoping um, to change that because these children are U.S. children. These are Mex Mexico's children. They have they are they would qualify for dual citizenship, and these children are are, are likely to return to the United States in their birth country. In the future, and therefore, if we, if we, the U.S. government, um, the United States, start investing in them, then, um, the, the like I said in my presentation, the benefits of that uh, far outweighs the cost in, in making sure that they have access to good health care and making sure that they will have a productive outcomes um, when they grow up. And so. I believe that it is our responsibility, both it is Mexican responsibility and U.S. responsibility to take care of these children and recognize that they have been forgotten for a long time. Thank you. Yeah, I would just add, oh, quickly, yes, I just please, did a, you know, an evaluation of a child who was in um, a position uh, that is very much a result of this, um, you know, being a U.S. A citizen child in Mexico where the, the, the child was essentially excluded from the Mexican health system um, and suffered a lot of consequences and his mother had been deported and was not allowed to come to the United States. So the child then at that point had suffered these pretty severe health consequences of lack of access to appropriate care in Mexico. And the only place where he could get care was, you know, across the border. So I had to sort of do a humanitarian parole evaluation for the mother who was his primary caregiver and did everything for him. Um, and, you know, I just think that this is going to be something that we're going to encounter more and more, and we really don't have a great way of dealing with this. I, I just really appreciate that, that work of yours, um, Sharon. Yes, thank you. And I just wanted to add that I think having more than 40% of U.S. citizen migrant children living in states near the U.S. border is really a missed opportunity for the United States to really invest in these children because these children, especially those that live within the 80 municipalities, 100 kilometers of, south of the U.S. border, can have access to really good health care through Medicaid or their CHIP benefits. And we can continue financing the health care for these kids and ensure that they get timely care, that they don't have, that they're not subjected to financial risk, um, them and their families. So I think that there's a great opportunity there for us to um, help um, share the care for these children and youth. Uh, I'll direct one last question to Elizabeth. Uh, you mentioned that uh, life expectancy is a key indicator and often used to motivate uh, change. Of course, you're at the University of Wisconsin where you do a lot of population health work and county rankings and the like. I just wonder if you could put the findings about life expectancy in the context of some of the other 
indicators that we often use at the population level um, and how those can potentially be used to motivate uh, policy change? Sure, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, because our study's purpose was primarily descriptive, we didn't have the ability to um, systematically explain the mechanisms for the disparities we ident identified. But we did um, look at a selection of socioeconomic and clinical care measures from our county health rankings in order to um, look at how they situate in the region versus the rest of the country. And so we found similar patterns, but we did find that the border region um, suffered from higher unemployment than um, both the areas as well as um, notably higher proportions of uninsured residents and children living in poverty. And so I think that that just, the, dis the disparities we found in life expectancy and some of those other indicators just really point to the inextricable link between structural drivers of health inequities that disproportionately disadvantage people of color in the US and the um, historical and cultural context that these populations are living in, that they've been subject to discrimination. And um, this has known impacts across the health factor and health outcome board, and it has impacts for generations. And so I think that um, moving forward and continuing to monitor as many health indicators as we can for these um, populations that have sometimes been hard to measure, I think is just going to be increasingly important. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank all of our authors. As a number of you mentioned, there's much more in your papers. We've asked you to give quite brief presentations. And so for those of you listening and watching, uh, I would encourage you to take a deeper look in the written materials. But you all did a terrific job of summarizing your complex findings and your work and answering a few questions for us. So thank you so much for uh, publishing with us and joining us today. Uh, we'll now be moving to a panel discussion, and I want to introduce our panelists, and uh, we're going to shift more into a pure policy focus, talking about health policy at the border. And of course, uh, immigration policy is central to health policy, but as a health policy journal, we're going to try to keep our focus as much on health as we can. Uh, we're going to hear from Arturo Vargas Bustamante, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. I mentioned uh, that Arturo was our theme issue advisor. I have to say um, the role you played in this issue was really uh, outstanding. Uh, the effort you put in to make it a success, we, we, uh, we relied very heavily on you and we're very grateful for all that you did to make this uh, so good. So we're thrilled to have you in this conversation. Uh, so she's Castaneda, a uh, medical anthropologist by training, founding director of the Health Initiative of the Americas at the UC Berkeley School of Public Health, uh, formerly a professor of public health sciences at Mexico's National Institute of Public Health, where she directed the Department of Reproductive Health. And uh, Ilda Davila, a uh, former director general of the Mexico Secretariat of Health and secretary to the Minister of Health. I think I got that right. You'll fix it if I got it wrong. Uh, formerly deputy director of administ for administration and information of the Institute of for Mexicans Abroad. And in 2014, appointed by the Mexican Secretary of Health as a delegate to the US-Mexico Border Health Commission and she was instrumental in the production of the Healthy Border 2020 report. So we have a cross-border uh, panel uh, with uh, tremendous depth and expertise. What we've asked is for each of you to just spend a few minutes, and I know it's hard to do in a few minutes, but I'll ask each of you to just spend a few minutes setting the stage. What do you see as the central issues around health at the border? And then uh, we'll have a conversation amongst us, bringing in questions from the audience and uh, questions I may pose and questions you may want to pose to each other. Um, Arturo, I'll turn to you to start us off. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and thank you very much for like, the invitation to uh, be the theme advisor to this issue. I think the papers were outstanding. It was uh, really a great privilege to be able to be part of this uh, uh, creation of this issue. The research that is being uh, uh, published is I think very novel and will bring uh, perspective to the new 
uh, the new debate that is right now happening at the US-Mexico border, uh, particularly in the case of health and health policy. And to set the stage of, uh, of this discussion, I think I would like to talk about how this border is a relatively not very old border that was set up in the mid 1800s, has evolved uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, it's a border where uh, it was from the Mexican side, it was incredibly uh, scarce of population in just 20 years ago. And since NAFTA uh, was signed, and right now it's uh, uh, the, the new treaty that uh, the substitute NAFTA, the USMCA, uh, have been uh, enacted, the economic integration of both countries has accelerated at a dramatic stage. Um, that has brought a lot of, attracted a lot of population to this area. And in just a few years, uh, the institutions from both from organizations from the US and Mexico had to set in place an entire framework on how to deliver healthcare uh, and how to improve the health of a population that is rapidly settling in this area. Even culturally, like uh, the, the region has evolved in its own uh, way as, uh, as a unique region. People from San Diego know their culture in Tijuana. Uh, people in El Paso know people in, uh, in uh, Ciudad Juarez. So that has led to how we can coordinate better in order for us to ensure a much better uh, healthcare delivery system, schemes of health insurance coverage, and at the end of the day, how to improve the health challenges that we can identify right now at the border. One of the two main issues that I think are important in trying to establish this collaboration between the US and Mexico is acknowledging the huge levels in economic development between the, the two uh, areas. You know? And these disparities in both uh, uh, economic uh, growth, the type of living standards made this region particularly challenging to be able to collaborate in terms of policy making and in creating uh, binational schemes. However, it's not uh, uh, impossible. No? There's, there's like examples of cross-border collaboration between authorities in the US side with authorities in Mexico that have set in place uh, policies and programs that have been effective at uh, sharing information, at coordinating regulations, at ensuring that quality of care uh, of users of healthcare services in both sides of the border is ensured. So I think that we should take into account this type of successful experiences in order for us to frame what would be the collaboration between the US and Mexico uh, towards the future. Uh, I think particularly important is gonna be how the border is gonna look after COVID-19. Right now we are, from the research point of view, we're having one of these great natural experiments where you essentially close the border for almost a year. So what's gonna happen afterwards is gonna give us a lot of information on how to set up the stage for policymakers to create new programs and interventions that could potentially be effective at improving the health of people in both sides of the border. I think that that's what I would have to say to setting the stage and I will uh, invite either Sochil or Ilda to continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. I want to especially recognize Sandra Hernandez, Arturo, Hilda, all dear friends and colleagues who have contributed so much to improve the health of immigrants. And in general terms to all the authors of this special edition for their complementary perspectives. As Arturo was saying, we share one of the most transient borders of the world which is a very porous space that exists and will exist beyond politics. It is not just a border between two countries, but a border or perhaps a metaphor between developed and developing realities and why not to say consumption realities and modalities. It is a border between the largest economy of the world and with countries that are economically strong, like Mexico, which is the 13th largest economy of the world, and other countries in the region that have been historically struggling not to fail. 
when we talk about the border, we are also referring to this fine line between many cultures. Uh, and that includes the over 54 million of Latinx that we are living in the US and contributing so much to both here and our communities of origin. So when we talk about the future of health policies, I would like to, to highlight at least three points. And this is just to start some conversations, some, some departure points. First one, migration is a phenomenon that has existed since we became human beings. Um, it should not be framed it as a problem. The problem is that we have politicized it and not always for positive purposes. Number two, migration will but increase in the near future. And this is due to a wide variety of factors, including, including but not limited to love. When we talk about family reunification, we are talking about love. When we are talking about unaccompanied on a on a minors, we are talking also about love. Economic disparities means we are talking about poverty, hunger, but we are also talking about political corruption. We are talking about violence, gangs, etc., cetera. And, and the big giant, climate change. We are, and we are gonna be increasingly experiencing droughts, hurricanes, volcanoes, explosions, everything. And my third point is related to, to all these two is that we are not prepared. We are not prepared from the institutional point of view. For example, hospitals, clinics, insurance mechanisms, um, workforce, not enough doctors, nurses, psychologists that understands the specificities of populations on the move or our societies, our societies that we are seeing has and have always have, and we hope it will change deep roots of racism, the fear of the other, even more if the color of their skin is darker. But our institutions have opportunities too, and more are obligations, and that is to contribute to reduce this gap. Just to talk about climate change, that I prefer to call it in this settings climate justice, because it is as it refers to people uh, who sometimes contribute the less on this climate change, but are suffering the more, and we are criminalizing it. And some of the authors have talked about that. Just as a reference, in 215, there were around 60 million of environmental refugees in the world. But we expect almost a billion by the year 2050. Just in the last six months, 10 million people around the globe were displaced due to environmental factors. And that's according to IOM. So, and this is my third point, we need to rehumanize migration. Migrants are human beings with their dreams and fears. Without them, the communities of origin, transit, destination will not be able to thrive as we have been doing. Um, there are various perspectives. In a more utilitarian perspective, migrants will be needed in the region as we are aging. Well, I will finish to say that in sum, we need a regional approach beyond national borders. And this regional approach need to be centered in human beings with their dreams, fears, but also their resilient capabilities and needed, needed skills that they have 
that could make this region the most vibrant of the planet, not a region as we are experiencing, which is going through a terrible humanitarian crisis. This is my perspective, a humanitarian perspective. And I think this perspective is needed to consider when talking about the future of health policies, which also implies the political will, not just from the governments, but also from the academia and of other institutions, including the philanthropic world. And I think this special edition uh, illustrates that si se puede. Gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, Ilda? Thank you, Alan, and thank you for the presentation. And I, I'm really honored to be with Arturo and Sochil today. I would like to commend Health Affairs, the Health Affairs team, and the amazing group of authors for putting together an extraordinary issue that provides solid information and a way forward to deal with two of the most important issues that at least until a couple of years ago were seldom priorities at national agendas, either in Mexico or in the United States, such as health and immigration. When I mean priorities, I mean that you have the funding, that you have a stable budget, that you have a budget enough to address the challenges that you face. So this health affairs issue is pure gold, and I'm talking as a prior public servant at the Mexican Federal Secretary of Health, is pure goal for policymakers on both sides of the border. COVID-19 pandemic has put in evidence that there is no back to normal. And this opens the possibility of new ways of integrating health policy at the border that includes immigrants. We must redefine a binational way in how we choose to work with each other. We have a changing public health architecture that needs a common platform that is both trusted and flexible enough to jointly address these complex threats to public health at the border. And I, would, I think that three C's are needed, collaboration, coordination, and communication. And let me briefly develop each one of them. Collaboration, you need to have in place networks and partnerships, binational partnerships before any crisis erupts. We all need to be on the same page and we have to stop working in silos as, as we have done previously. We need to have local, state and federal public health departments along with other departments, specifically those that deal with immigration, to sit together in a small compact group on a regular way and, and that are able to be efficient in addressing uh, challenges. You also need to include all NGOs. I mean, we know that at the border, NGOs, the, the local is prevalent and that there is a long standing history of NGOs at the border and that they have developed very fruitful relationships with all key stakeholders and that work in a very effective, in, in a, in a very effective uh, fashion. These NGOs are all, always closer to the problems and they have uh, an increased potential to detect and address health issues in a more effective and opportune manner. The second C, coordination. Local networks must be made part of policy coordination that are led by local government when you're dealing with public health. No. The third C, communication. In the border context, where you find multiple and diverse actors, coordination and communication challenges are huge. At the border, as I said previously, the local has more weight in taking decisions and in framing responses that respond to, to, to the immediate reality. When we in Mexico City were at the federal level taking decisions and, instrument, and, and trying to imagine policies as Yetza was selling, we were sometimes very far away where the problems were really taking place. So we need to change this. And the challenge has always been 
along the border to have the same communication as Sandra Hernandez very well pointed. I mean, we have always looked at Sonora and Arizona as an example of communication. Well, the challenge is that you need to have the same communication all along the border. And this is a challenge that the US-Mexico Border Health Commission has been facing for over a long years. I mean, the Border Health Commission was established in 2000 and we're still dealing with these issues. And I like very much what uh, Sharon Borja uh, proposed in, in the recommendations, how the Border Health Commission should, should have um, a small compact group that monitors health status at the border. So we have now a current situation um, and an opportunity to transform the way business has been carried out. And I will stop there to encourage um, dialogue. Wonderful, thank you for those uh, opening comments. I wanna pick up uh, Hilda on what you just said about when you were in Mexico City, you know, the same thing is said in the US, the policymakers in Washington don't have any idea what's going on uh, along the border. My question to all of you is really the balance. Uh, I was going to ask it as an either or, but I know the answer is both. So what's the balance between the need for national level coordination, but also the need for local, whether it's NGOs or the communities, uh, city and state governments themselves, doing the work, just sort of acknowledging that the that the central governments in both countries are, are never going to have this as much front and center as the local communities. And uh, certainly in the US side, it's a highly politicized topic, which is generally more of an impediment than an aid. So how, how do we think about uh, a balance of, of national and bilateral national relationships uh, in addition to, in conjunction with local, whether it's uh, NGO or, or city st uh, state governments working together. How, how do we put these pieces together? Yolda, go ahead. Thank you, Ellen. Well, as I was uh, fed, as you call uh, us, I mean, everybody hates the feds because the feds are far away from where, from where the problems are taking place. But I need that we, what we need to do is to educate the federal um, secretariats, the federal departments, either of health or Homeland uh, Department in Mexico or the Secretaria de Gobernación, which is the interior secretariat in Mexico that deals with migration and the federal department of health uh, in how to listen and how to decentralize that taking the responsibility. I know it's a shared responsibility that, that we have, but we need to decentralize the decision making uh, and to bring it closer to where the problems are really taking place. We all know that we all need federal guidelines and federal norms when we're dealing with public health issues, for example, or we're dealing with epidemiological information. We need to integrate, we need to have the same information that it is a base information. But we also need to learn how to decentralize and how to let the people who are nearer to the problems to have the responsibility to address the problems and to propose solutions to this to these problems. And I will add to what Hilda said, it's a more a regional perspective. Because the problem is not just between two countries, but it's it's a regional problem. So if uh, Mexico, as was mentioned, just seen immigrants as a transit or as Yetza was saying, when they return, they become Mexicans again. Um, it's, it's a very narrow perspective. I think a regional um, perspective is needed to have a, a more coordinated um, efforts and results. You know, Arturo, I was really struck in your opening comments about uh, it's a relatively young border by global standards and was relatively uh, unpopulated on the Mexican side until not so long ago. Um, and then I think about the changes in policy, but also the changes in migratory patterns, not just as a result of policy, as a result of economics and, um, and climate as we've discussed and the region. And I think, how could we possibly expect to get it right so quickly? 
Uh, there's th this is so dynamic. Policy is slow, and these changes are so rapid. So how do we build systems that can tolerate a shift in the general direction of migration from one direction to the other, or a shift in uh, the size of the population on either side, or the the number of people who are in Mexico in transit when the systems were largely built for you know, adult uh, men coming from Mexico. How, how, what, what kind of infrastructure works to handle these dramatic changes in, in human behavior? Yeah, I think that the border has been learning how to deal with these like very sudden and very quick changes in migration patterns, in the profile of immigrants. And obviously, policymakers at the border have to deal with all these uh, legal and regulatory, regulatory challenges, you know? having to cope with uh, restrictions at the federal level, um, at the state level, uh, requests from their citizens to address problems, and also trying to talk to your counterparts across the border to deal with common problems together. Uh, but but the, those counterparts are also dealing with very similar issues in their own side. So I think that we have been working and trying to find better ways of uh, communicating with each other to uh, foster what we academics call be much better interagency collaboration. It's a, it's a matter of study, sometimes even within um, uh, agencies within the same countries, it's hard to find the right balance. So now even across agencies, across different countries, uh, dealing with different types of legal and like, like infrastructure, uh, uh, legal frameworks, and also with issues of rule of law. Now, even when you, let's say, establish an agreement on how to deal with certain regulations on the other side of the border, whether they are going to be implemented becomes an issue. So trying to find, first of all, acknowledge that those uh, different, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to call them problems because those are a matter of having two so different countries in terms of economic development bordering each other. You know? So you need to address, acknowledge that those uh, situations exist. And then you have to learn how to navigate and be pragmatic about it. You now we have a common border, we need to learn how to deal with it. And by acknowledging that sometimes may some of these uh, re, very stringent regulations may not be they may not be uh, implemented, then how you find a way to still find a solution to that problem without requiring or expecting uh, a very complicated solution to that problem. You know? I think that's the key. And as I, I, my view of the border is that well, it's a relatively everyone has been there for not that long. So trying to figure out to construct those institutions that will help us work together better will take some time. And I think that right now, if we see the progress, let's say from the late 70s, when this border started to grow out at very, very fast rates to right now, I think that historically speaking, we, we have done very good progress, but we still have a lot of work to do in order for us to find that this much more effective way of uh, talking to each other to address common problems. Uh, you know, one of the institutions, and uh, especially I'll come to you, um, uh, I, that uh, was mentioned in one of the questions is the Windows of Health, the uh, Ventanillas de Salud, uh, where any Mexican citizen can go to uh, an embassy in the, in the US uh, to seek assistance. Uh, one of the questions asked was, could the US do something similar in Mexico? But I want to more broadly ask the question, uh, what, is the what is the possibility associated with programs like that to just sort of have a, a resource center to clear the path one person at a time so it's treated as a personal issue um, and trying to overcome barriers in addition to the broader policy question? I don't know if Ilda, you want to talk about that, but so Sheila, I know you wanted to jump in. So why don't you go first? I want to come in on that, but first let me be controversial with Arturo. Uh, the border Arturo crosses. The border is not so new. The border has historically been there and will be there. Mexico was this that we call now California was part of Mexico 200 years ago. So you know it it depends. And I think some of the concepts that at least in anthropology we are trying to use to understand this is the concept of translocalities. 
not transnationals, because there are a lot of interactions between states and between networks of human beings. So that's something that we have to, to take into account. In relation to the second um, aspect, Alan, um, when we created, uh, Anilda was there those days, the Ventanillas de Salud 20 years ago, uh, we didn't think it just to be the service for uh, Mexicans. In, in fact, uh, whoever wants to have service or referral benefit from the Ventanillas uh, could do that. And we have created other models, such as Binational Health Week, for example, in which many countries, and this is again the regional perspective, perhaps a Bolivar, a Bolivar dream, in which Latin America can share opportunities. So for Binational Health Week events, we don't do it in isolation as a country, but we do it as a region. So for example, one consulate works with other Central Americans or from other countries of Latin America. And I think that's a model that can be also um, developed, for example, in the academia. We cannot just focus research in the border between these latitudes, but in the movement of people from the region. That's my, my perspective. As Sochil very well pointedly, I mean, Mexico has the largest consular network that any one country has in another country. So we have 50 uh, health windows that help you navigate, help the Mexican population navigate in the very complex United States health system. And I think it has to be very successful. We also now have mobile units that do outreach and that because people sometimes, especially during the Trump administration, were afraid of going to the Mexican consulate to do their, their things that they needed, the matricula consular. So now we did the outreach with 11 mobile health units. And I think it's a very interesting idea because I think these this, these units, as, as, as one of the uh, Rodrigo was saying, I mean, we, we have lack of reintegration programs and we need to educate our people if, if the possibility comes that they have to return either in a voluntary or in an involuntary manner that they need to know how are they going now to navigate in the Mexican health system. And I think, I mean, we have a huge problem there in this all the returnees that, are, that, that will be coming back. But I think that the Ventanillas de Salud program, these health windows, is a very successful model and it is a very well kept secret, unfortunately, for many people. And, and, and I would be a lot to share with you, but it's probably in some other um, um, seminar, what the Mexican uh, govern, federal government, which is the Foreign Affairs Secretariat, along with the Mex federal uh, health department, and along with very valuable, partnerships as Sochil um, was saying and Sochil herself was part of this very successful strategy. But it will be very interesting to have these uh, ventanillas now in Mexico as well, orientating people that are might want to migrate or that have returned to Mexico. Well, I'm uh, sorry to say that this rich conversation needs to come to an end. Um, I'm very appreciative of your thoughts and you've put out so many ideas that we just have a glimmer of them and I know the conversation will continue, which is what we always hope at Health Affairs is that we're just a, a spark and then the fire can continue to burn. So uh, thank you all for your thoughts on this. I want to again acknowledge the support of the California Healthcare Foundation, the California Endowment, the Kanama Health Foundation, uh, Arturo, I want to once again acknowledge your contribution uh, to all of you listening and watching. I hope you'll take a, a, a closer look at the papers and uh, we'll have another conversation focused primarily on immigrant health, uh, which will I'm sure be just as rich as this, but I feel that we've covered this topic uh, at least it, it, at, at an introductory level. And uh, the notion that we can think of these issues as um, not problems, but as people and needs to be met and programs and infrastructure that needs to be able to handle those needs and evolve and learn 
and acknowledge the dynamics of the border communities. Those are all uh, lessons I think that we can take for today. Uh, once again, thank you to our presenters and thank to you, thanks to all of you for uh, listening. We are adjourned.